Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Noam and Jason, everyone who's here to help <clears throat> make this happen. Excuse me. <clears throat> I notice if I have dinner before I teach, it's a little more interesting <laughs> in terms of what's going on um, with the voice. So excuse me. Uh, my name is Lopin Chandra, and I'm so happy that Eve and I get to teach together tonight. It was kind of a spontaneous uh, arising of us both uh, being able to come together and share the space with you all. We are all students and teachers here at uh, SFDC. Such a beautifully run, peer run, um, sangha run organization that really does um, bring a special flavor to the world of Dharma as it's offered in the modern West here in the wild, wild West of San Francisco Bay Area. <laughs> and of course, like always, um, people and movements that happen here are on the cutting edge. And so it's a real pleasure to be here and to support this great uh, community. And as Pamela said, any little donation really does help while we're here in our virtual land and getting ready to have uh, actually some premises at some point. So what we thought we'd do tonight is do kind of like a Tonglen refresh. So how many people here, just let me see a little show of hands, either real hands or electronic hands, are totally new tonight, if you don't mind sharing your welcome. Of course, we love new people, but I have a feeling that uh, maybe I'm not seeing any hands right now. There are. We're a pretty consistent, solid crew. Karen, good. I'm glad you're new. Welcome. So the reason I ask is because one of the one of the bedrock practices that we're doing here tonight is the Tonglen. On every Wednesday night, we've been exploring the different mind training slogans that are so well known. There are 59, and each week we usually touch on one, and then we meditate. And so we do shamatha, we do settling the mind in its natural state, a specific kind of uh, Dzogchen, Tibetan Buddhist style of, of shamatha, which is very nourishing and accessible. Both Eve and I <clears throat> love teaching it and love doing it. And then we also supplement the that more mindfulness-based shamatha practice with a compassion practice called Tonglen. And so we thought it'd be nice to do a refresher here because sometimes uh, we just do a shorter practice of Tonglen, sometimes we don't do much of it at all. So as a way for the new people who are here, but also for those returning students to really deepen in our experience of Tonglen, I will guide us through really kind of like a survey of the full arc of the Tonglen practice. But before we do that, I want to say a little bit about what it is. So Tonglen is a Tibetan word that literally means sending and receiving. Sending and receiving. So sending is the tong, and the, the receiving or taking is the len. So tong is sending, len is receiving. And it's a breath practice, in fact, where we imagine that on the outbreath, we send well wishes, loving kindness, compassion, the so-called remedy of whatever might be in need in the world or in a specific person you might be thinking of and praying for. So the outbreath is that well wish, the metta, the sending is the loving kindness. And then the inhale <clears throat> is the receiving, is the taking in. And this is where it gets a little more edgy than your kind of run-of-the-mill or standard metta practice, which means loving-kindness. Because it's with the in-breath that we consciously take in that which we would normally turn away from, perhaps. So if we're working with another or with the world, we actually, with prayer, with visualization, with intention, we imagine so we're not literally doing it, but we're imagining that we're stretching our heart open like, you know, Hanuman has this. Have you seen these wonderful paintings of Hanuman? Yeah, yeah, Nick, exactly, where he reaches it down and pulls open his heart. And in his chest is his guru, Ram, who he's utterly devoted to. 
So in a way, the the len of the tonglen, the receiving, is that moment of Hanuman, like opening the heart and taking in and transmuting the poison into nectar, right? So, for example, if we are working with a loved one who might be uh, experiencing uh, chronic illness or life-threatening disease, you could imagine them in the space in front of you, and the visualization is is usually like imagining that they're surrounded by a kind of whatever their suffering is takes the form of like a dark smoky vapor, like a cloud, like smog. <laughs> and with the in-breath, you have the intention to relieve them of their suffering and breathe it into that Hanuman heart, that infinite capacity heart of devotion and love, where you transform the illness or the suffering, whatever it might be, within that ultimate indestructible space of the heart that is the nature of your pure primordial being. It's like Hanuman, really. <laughs> it's like Ram is in there. who's like, can't be hurt. And so you breathe in, transform that which we would normally not want. And then we breathe out what we would normally want. So it's a, it's like turning the tables. We offer that which we would normally take and we take in what we would normally give away. Does that make sense? So in this sense, the out-breath is the metta, is the loving kindness, and the in-breath is the karuna, the compassion. These are two very important practices uh, in Buddhism. So the loving kindness is may you be well, may you be free from suffering, whatever aspiration and prayer you wish rides out, on the out breath and then on the in breath the compassion which is slightly different within the buddhist tradition in the sense of it's different than metta in the sense that of course it's infused with metta of love but it's that next step of wishing to help free others from suffering so wishing in some way aspiring to be uh, of aid to be of service I'm not saying metta doesn't want to do that, but in the classic text, metta is the this the wish of, of for people to have joy, peace, love, well-being, goodness in their life, and compassion is the prayer to help relieve the suffering that might be there. And so, in some commentaries, they talk about the in and the out breath with this rhythm of metta on the out breath. Karuna, compassion on the in-breath. And so I'll guide us through, I'll guide you through the practice, and we'll work through the four phases that are so classical within the metta practice, as, as some of you might know, as well as within the karuna practices like Donglen, which are we always start with ourself. Some of you will remember the first uh, one of the first phrases in the Lojong slogans, which m says, train in sending and receiving with the breath and start with yourself. So we'll do some donglen for ourselves, for any aspects of ourselves that have been exiled or suffering or we've, we haven't tuned into lately that might need some attention. Welcoming those into the heart with donglen, with the breath. So that's the first stage of donglen. The second is then to work with a loved one, someone towards whom it's quite easy to feel love, compassion for. Could be a friend, could be a partner, could be a, a sibling, parent. Then the third phase is to work with a so-called neutral person, which is very interesting. Maybe somebody you don't really know, but you see in your neighborhood, you see at the market, the postal service, people maybe you do, you don't know very well, but you see them, they are in your life, but you don't know, you don't like or dislike them. You have sort of a neutral feeling towards them. And it doesn't have to be like 100% neutral. <laughs> like, you know, I like my mailman, you know, but he's kind of a neutral person in my life because I don't know about his life. I'm not invested in his life. I don't uh, have intimacy with him. So what's so 
so interesting about working with this neutral person is that I would posit that most of the beings in the world might fall in that category for you. Like we don't know most of the people in the world. And so this might seem like a nothing category, but it's actually a really uh, revelatory category. And it, you'll find that it shifts the way you, rea- you respond, react, inter- interreact, uh, interact with people in the world around you. I've noticed it's kind of made me a little bit more sensitive and mindful and feel connected with people out there in the world. So that's the uh, third. And then the fourth category is, dun da 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 what do you think? <laughs> yeah. No, not yet. Not the whole world, Diane. I think you're going whole world. But what's before the, the whole world? Yeah, yeah, Pamela's our so-called enemies, right? So the people who, you know, you might not have an enemy, really, but like who triggers you, (laughs) who challenges you? Uh, Maybe you do have an enemy, then you can work with them. Or maybe you have a few. Uh, It's usually good to work with one so you don't get too overwhelmed or convoluted per sitting. Then you can move to the next in the next sitting. (laughs) So that is the fourth, the so-called enemy. Someone who really presses your buttons. Someone towards whom you're kind of like, oh, I wish they'd just go away. Or they're so wrong. Or they hurt me. Such a juicy and important uh, dynamic to work with in the the Tonglen. And it's challenging. That's why we work up to it. And then the grand finale is this opening the arms as wide as the world like Diane did. This this moment of pure Hanuman's devotion to the whole world of existence and spending some time doing Tonglen for all beings everywhere. And so we do this to counteract the um, kind of biological, maybe baseline, more instinctive way of um, relating to the world or reacting to the world, which is very eye-centered or protective, um, maybe isolating. Uh, In Buddhism, we call it self-grasping or self-clinging. So Donglen really helps to kind of soften that grasping, soften the clinging knee-jerk reaction that we might have and help us feel more connected and more compassionate towards others, especially toward our enemies. And we'll see in the slogan after we meditate, um, why, yet again, why are those people who challenge us are so great for our practice. They really are gifts in our spiritual practice. So Lo Jong in general, just to wrap it up, and then we'll practice. Lo Jong in general is working towards releasing self-grasping and self-clinging and increasing, let me say this again, Releasing, lojong is about releasing self-cherishing, small-minded thinking, and increasing other cherishing, cherishing others, really caring and feeling connected and compassionate towards others. That's a real sign if you know that lojong and then the Tonglen meditation, they're working is if you're feeling a decrease in the fear-based self-grasping and an increase in a more open, connected, uh, compassionate way of being with the world and with yourself. Okay, so Eve, would you like to add anything to that before we start? Beautiful, Chandra. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. So let's settle in. We'll do, you know, about a half an hour like we usually do. Close your eyes. You can dim your screen. I think Eve taught me that tip. It's nice. You just dim your screen. You don't have to see anyone. I'm going to dim my little light here. The Tonglen is usually done with the eyes closed. Just make sure you're comfortable. You can do it in a seated position. You can lie in the supine posture, as Alan calls it, the infirmary. (laughs) If you feel like you need to relax in the infirmary, you can do a supine position of meditation. 
And begin by taking some deep breaths. And releasing tension with the out breath. Feel it melting, melting down into the earth beneath you. Any tension in the skull, the face, the jaw, the base of the skull and the neck, just releasing with each out breath. along the spine, the arms, the hands, the hips and legs, the belly, the belt line, soft and receptive to the breath and release the tension that's perhaps lived in you throughout the day. Let that unravel. Melt down into the earth beneath you with each out breath. Now let's take a moment to give rise to a heartfelt motivation for our practice. Feeling the breath in your body and really coming home to what's true for you right now. Perhaps this is the first time in your day you've checked in. How, how's it going in there? Sometimes to help me do that, I put my hand on my heart or my belly. Like a friend saying, hi friend, I see you. How are you? You can even speak out loud a word or two, just saying what you find there. And let's spend some time with the breath in the body, feeling the breath as a nourishing recharge of nutrients in the body, nourishing the soul as well as the mind. You may feel the mental energy still swirling around, so active during the day. And with each out breath, just like tension in the body, the out breath instigates an unwinding, an unraveling, a releasing of the knots of thoughts. And you may feel an experience of kind of like a horizontal opening of your awareness. Feeling that unraveling of the mental knots, revealing that vast space that's always within you. It's 
like a warm space permeated with awareness. And that very nature of awareness has this flavor of, of a simple and very essential love. Like awareness is a love story of awareness in relationship with all the world. There's love in that relationship. It's the fabric of awareness. So breathe that love, just breathe and release, breathe and release. Don't think it or make anything happen here, just feeling that natural, your own unique footprint of how this feels to you. When the mind starts co-opting the moment, just notice, give it a little love, tap, and then release it like a popping of a little effervescent bubble. The thoughts are just insubstantial formations that arise and pass within your awareness. They're not the focus right now. Nothing to solve, nothing to figure out or ponder. Your assignment here is just to ride the breath with your awareness, like a horse and its rider. So it flows in and out of this space of love and awareness. Now feel the beating heart in your chest. And feel that as a pulse drawing your attention to the very innermost cavern of your heart center, this heart chakra, this confluence of energy, right at the center of the sternum. It's said to be like the seat of the soul. This feeling of your central axis, the center point, right in the middle of the sternum. And you may feel that space of that innermost indwelling heart, like an orb of radiant light, like a little moon, a bindu, a sphere of light. And 
Just feel the breath drawing in, illuminating, oxygenating that sphere of light. And then breathing out, opening that and letting that light spread throughout your body like moonlight radiating in all directions, filling every pore, every cell of your body. So the in-breath is a breathing in to the heart space, centralizing your awareness there, illuminating, and then exhale, let it spread and release. And as you breathe, you may notice some constriction or tightness in the heart space. Maybe there's some guarding. Just feel the breath massaging that and bringing awareness to it. And the out breath is an opening, maybe a little more space. So each breath is landing you more fully in that which is already present. It's not like you're creating it. It's something that's there, your innermost essence, your own nature of your own mind, consciousness. And then you may also already be feeling some areas of tightness or conflict or emotional vulnerability. Maybe you've come to class tonight with a little ache or pain, heartbreak, fear. Maybe just we'll spend some time here just doing one or two piece by piece, feeling into something you'd like to invite into the heart and taking some breaths with that. And feel where it is in your body and breathe at home to the heart space, that luminous orb of light. And let this be intuitive. And breathe out, a welcoming and accepting you may even breathe out a remedy. It might be if I'm breathing in fear. You could breathe out something like trust. Let it permeate my body. We'll spend some time in silence working with one or two things at your own rhythm with the breath.
the course of the next few breaths, we'll start to shift to the next phase after working with ourselves. Work with a loved one. And in this phase, in the subsequent phases, we can work with more of our imagination. So bringing forth in the mind's eye uh, the image of a loved one you'd like to work with tonight. Maybe somebody who's been suffering or needs some prayer or healing. And see them in your mind's eyes as clearly as you can, perhaps remembering how they looked the last time you saw them. And remembering the tongue with the out-breath, the len with the in-breath, you can imagine that that suffering or illness they may be experiencing surrounds them like a smoky fog smog. And with the in-breath, a heartfelt aspiration to help relieve them of their suffering by breathing it in as a texture of smoky vapor into the heart space. That luminous orb of light at your heart evaporates it on the spot. And then breathing out a heartfelt metta, the Tong, sending of prayer, of healing, whatever intuitively feels like a, a remedy. Letting this ride the breath with each in-breath, breathing in the smoky vapor, transforming it at your heart, and then breathing out a cool, clear breeze of healing, love, prayer. Continue like this. Each breath lightens their load, clears their energy field, clears their body, mind. Each out breath offers nourishment. We feel that with each breath, the heart softens a bit, blooms more and more like a lotus. And with the next few breaths, really feel, sense, see that their ailment, their suffering is completely f relieved. And really like a vision quest for a moment, see them in their true glory. What would they look and feel like if they were flourishing? A full life's abundance and purpose and health. Really wish that for them. May it be so. And 
dissolving that visualization and now inviting into the mind's eye the space of imagination, the so-called neutral person in your life, your neighborhood, your market, your work, your community, someone towards whom you don't have a strong repulsion or a strong attraction towards. And see them as clearly as you can in your mind's eye. When did you see them last? What did they look like? And even though you may not know them, you may have an intuitive sense of some, some ailment, some suffering, some weight that they carry. You don't have to know what it is, but even just imagining that any, any suffering they have surrounds them like a dark, smoky vapor. And with the in-breath, that heartfelt intent to help relieve that by imagining that you're breathing it in directly to the heart space where it evaporates upon contact, instantaneously transforms into a cool, clear, healing out-breath of loving kindness, freedom from suffering. We offer that with the out-breath, clearing that smoke. Inhale. Feeling that courage of taking it in. But it doesn't have the power to harm you. You breathe it out, transformed, and offer it to them. Who knows what this is doing for those we're imagining, but we can feel something shifting within our own heart. What is that? Can you taste it? Over the next few breaths, really feel and sense that their suffering is completely cleared and they step into their true flourishing of joy. Maybe there's a sparkle in their eyes, a smile on their face. May it be so. And letting that visualization dissolve back into the space from which it came, this imaginary space. And now we're moving into the domain of working with someone who challenges us. so-called enemy. And yet it could be our best friend. 
could be our partner, could be a parent. Maybe we love them deeply, but we also feel so much other content as well. Or maybe it's a real adversary. It could even be a public figure, someone maybe you don't know, but someone towards whom you feel aversion. Find someone who really brings that up in you so we can work with them. And see them as clearly as you can in your mind's eye. And recognizing that just like you, this person wishes to be free from suffering. Maybe confused about how to do it, but they too wish to be free of suffering. And at their deepest core, there's a goodness. And in that we share that common humanity. And so you can see their confusion, delusion, ignorance, anger, whatever it is that ails them, their suffering, surrounding them like a dark cloud. And with your Hanuman heart, and breathing in that smoky vapor, their suffering, transforming it, that luminous orb of indestructible light at your heart and breathe out and offer a remedy a cool clear healing but breeze and you could simply just internally say may you be well may you be free of suffering Working with the texture of the in-breath with the smoke, evaporating it at your orb of light at your heart, and breathing out a cool, clear, healing light. Stay with the breathing. With each breath, see if you can open your heart even more to this capacity of having compassion, having love and care, well wishes for even those who challenge us the most.
over the course of the next few breaths, really feeling, sensing, seeing the, the hindrance, the suffering lighten completely and see them stepping into their full flourishing. Maybe they're glowing, a twinkle in their eye, an expression of their true goodness that's buried or somewhere deep in there, shining forth. releasing that visualization and really feeling your heart space. Might have a different flavor than when you began. And now is this kind of opening of the heart even more, this infinite capacity is now open to receive the suffering of the whole world. May I be the boat for those who need to traverse the ocean, samsara, through the breath. You may imagine that you're looking at the world from the vantage point of the moon. And with the in-breath, taking in to that luminous orb of light at heart center, all that suffering, transforming it at the orb of light at your heart, the undying, indestructible nature of mind, breathing out a cool, clear, healing breeze that clears the pollution, the confusion, the destruction, the greed, the violence, Clears it, the cosmic wind. Stay with the breath. And feel, sense the world and all of its inhabitants find their balance, that homeostasis that we all have inborn within us. Just feel the world coming back into balance, beings happy, fed, nourished, safe. Breathe out that prayer with the out breath. Breathing in the courage to even just pray to make the aspiration to be of benefit, to relieve the suffering of the world and breathe out that freedom from suffering. And then we'll release the visualization and any sense of striving and just rest in the naturalness that is right now. And this feeling of everything being complete just as it is. Everything is already perfect. Everything is already done. And just rest. Rest in that simple being. and that deep knowing. And 
And then we'll close our practice with a heartfelt personal dedication of merit. It said that in this offering, the merit, the positive energy, the juice of your practice becomes limitless in that giving away. Make that offering. Thank you. So that was kind of the grand survey of the different stages of, of Donglen. And you can just do one of those. You don't have to do every single step in every sitting. You could just do a sitting with yourself. You could do a sitting with the so-called enemy if you're feeling it's really up for you. But now you kind of felt in one sitting the arc and the intelligence of how we kind of, we sneak up on the big grand finale, at least, you know, with the enemy, maybe that was the most challenging. Maybe not. Maybe working with yourself was the, the hardest one. Sometimes that's true for me anyway. So I'd love to open it up to questions, comments. I'd love to also bring Eve into the discussion too, please, Eve. Yeah. You can unmute if you want, or you can chat in a question. Thank you, Chandra. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for your practice. One of our, our hopes was to really invite this, this transformative practice back to the forefront of this evening. So we, um, <clears throat> we've been focusing a lot on settling the mind and it's so important, that skill and capacity. But this the skill and capacity of um, turning towards what's hard, so important, so important in all times. So hoping you got a flavor of, you know, maybe you turned towards what was hard and you just kind of bounced back couldn't really feel anything. Your, your defended heart just sprung up. No problem. Maybe you were feeling so pulled in by care. It was almost overwhelming. No problem. This is really just a survey of, in some ways, our um, the sweetness and uh, the challenge of inviting in this level of compassion, this level of uh, transformation, this level even of forgiveness on the spot. So the, there's no way you can do it wrong, just as a reminder for that. And we really, yeah, are eager to hear your questions and reflections. There's a lot of complex pieces in this practice. First of all, you're using visualization. And of course, for many of you, that's familiar. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy. So we are open for any and all questions. And I see that uh, either Pamela or Mace raise their hand. So please, love to hear from you. Thanks, Eve. Thanks, Chapandra. Um, I really, 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 really liked the way you talked about the breath and that the compassion was the in-breath and that the metta was the out-breath. Like, mm. that just really um, brought it for me in a new way. So... I just wanted to say thank you for offering that because that, that really like deepened it for me. Right. Isn't the Dharma so fabulous that you'll loop back around and around and you'll hear things, you'll hear new things, but you'll also hear things in a new way sometimes. For me, I had overlooked that until recently I found it in I think some of Alan's writings and I, I realized, oh, I had never really thought of it that way. So I'm glad you found that helpful too. I see something from Walt, appreciated the explanation of metta and karuna. Yeah, thank you. Those are the first two of the four immeasurables, right? So metta is loving kindness, uh, karuna is compassion, uh, empathetic joy is mudita, and equanimity is upeka or upeksha. These are classic teachings of the Buddha, sometimes called the Brahma Viharas in the earlier translation schools. So we're doing those two first two immeasurables with the breath. And then also we could say we're cultivating empathetic joy and equanimity while we're doing Tonglen too.
Any other questions or reflections? Don't be shy. Oh, Jimmy. Hi, you guys. Thank you so much, Chandra, for the for the Tonglen practice, the and the reminder of the the limitless capacity for that that space right at our center to be able to dissolve that suffering that we um, that we imagine and that we see. It was um, it was really really palpable for me this evening, particularly um, when I worked with myself and when I worked with um, my so-called enemy. My loved one, they're not suffering so much, but it was, I could imagine, I, nonetheless, there was that, that feeling of, of, um, of care and compassion for them and the bit of suffering that I, and the bit of striving that I know they, they do go through. And with the, um, the so-called stranger, the unfamiliar person, it was, I got my second injection of the Pfizer vaccine today. And on the way out, there was um, a woman who had also gotten the injection. And I, and I just, I just re remembered her walking out in front of me and, um, and just imagining the, the concern that she had about her health, of course. And then, but the, and, the, and then being able to, to, to transform that. But that reminder that there's this limitless capacity there to be able to work with that stuff, that was, that was so sweet. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing, that's beautiful. I see Ted and then I see Claudia. I don't know who's first, so. Go ahead, Ted. Okay, thanks, Claudia. Uh -huh. I was, try, you know, I was, try, I, I like twice tried to write this in the chat and then I just couldn't put it into words. So maybe I can put it, speak it better. I, I you know, it was hard to work with, um, with the difficult person, but in the middle of it, I really got this sense that, you know, this is as, this really is as much for me as it is for this other person. Um, I, I, it's it's all for me, not in the ego, not in the self sense, but actually in the selfless sense. Um, and that just kind of helped me open up much more. Um, so. That is fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Like that is that is it. You know, you had the epiphany. It might have been a soft epiphany or a larger one. But when we feel, oh, it's not really about them. Because I can't control them. But I can work with what's in here. And so you got that, Ted. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I think maybe we go Claudia, then we can do, I saw Suzanne and then Ramit. I don't know if those, that was the order, but that's the order I saw. Okay, good. All right, go for it. Oh, you're muted. Okay. I think a while ago, I was a little skeptical, if you want, about what is the point of this visualization and this tongue and you know the sending and receiving and uh how effective is this really or is this just something to make me feel good okay and um i have a sister-in-law who uh just recently got her had a uh surgery for cancer and the the woman has had 15 surgeries for different reasons. So I had been doing this Tonglen for her, you know, and uh, I was really stunned. A few days after she had the last surgery, 
I mean, everybody expected her to take forever to heal. I mean, all kinds of things. And she's just been recovering in a remarkable, I mean, even her husband, my brother-in-law was like, they knew that a bunch of people were praying for them. And, you know, I was doing my meditation, but it's just been amazing. And I don't know, you know, I mean, I just don't want it to sound like, oh, a miracle, but something, I, I, I don't know if it's our, all our positive energy that we have been sending to her and visualizing her. And, you know, I was, I was just visualize her surgeon being really skillful, but gentle, because this was a very, very difficult surgery. And she's just been doing incredible. And so it just, I don't know what to say, but uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Eve, please feel free to please share. That's beautiful. Yeah. We don't know really. And some of these things, I mean, I'd love to hear Eve talk about this too, but some of these things we just, we won't really know, but we feel it. And I've come to a place in my life where I feel like that's enough. You know, it feels, it feels true. Could be. Yeah, thank you. And especially if it helps, especially, you know, with, with this many surgeries, right, there can be a point of despair where we forget how to keep our heart open for that person. Oh, God, well, I mean, she's already been through so much. It's what's, what's the point, right? And so I think we can think of it as the training always and keeping our heart open. Um, and then uh, there's additional benefits as well. And there is limited research. It needs to be replicated at a far greater scale, but prayer has been associated with healing. It was a well-designed study, though it was a long time ago. Um, so I hope we see some of that kind of research happening again. I'm so glad to hear she's well, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, she's really accepted. I mean, when talking, she said, you know, I'm just, my days might be numbered, but I'm accepting reality. And I'm, I've decided to let go of fear and just uh, live the present, which was, which is remarkable and such resilience. And so I love that. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Suzanne. Hi. Hi. I'm looking for some um, feedback or advice around this. Every time I do this meditation, I struggle. And I don't struggle with feeling the compassion or feeling the, you know, or, you know, the once it's transformed, breathing out the, the meta. What I struggle with is the actual mechanics of the practice. It's too much for me to fit in the space of a breath. Mm -hmm. It's, I feel like it's, I can visualize the person. I can see, you know, feel the, the, the dark, the heavy. And then I have to, I'm breathing it in. And then the, you know, the visualization of it transforming, it gets, it gets muddied in there and, and then I'm breathing out and I feel like I'm behind. My, my breath is, is, is way ahead. Um, mm. I, haven't, I haven't been able to go through the whole process and it, it feels so fast. And it's the shifting of the gears and then going back to it being dark again and the, the cycle of it. I, mm. I don't know if I'm over visualizing or what I'm doing, but I just, I struggle with this like no other meditation, but yet I see that it's so valuable and I want to be able to do it more. So thoughts? Eve, you want to, do you want to offer first or do you want me? To no, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I will, I'll follow That's up. That's a great question. I love yeah. the, I love all of the questions and comments, but the, the nuts and bolts questions are so great. And so thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there are other people people who will benefit from this as well. Um, a couple of things come to mind. You could not, um, in a sense, you could kind of loosen the visualization and not have it be so, so much writing on one breath. You know, you 
could just take a sip, <laughs> take a sip, take a sip breath of, of the suffering, transform it, and then you could build over time if that feels like it's working. There is a kind of an in and an outflow, like a hypnotic rhythm too. So, you know, you could just take one breath and then sit with it, feel the transform and take a few more breaths while, and then really do one big out breath. And, but I've never heard anyone teach it that way. So I would mm -hmm. say maybe instead take in the smaller sip, take in. And there are a couple of different commentaries to this question, to this practice, which are interesting. The one that I'm most familiar with and comfortable, like that I do most is where you imagine that you breathe it in directly into the heart space, like almost like you're breathing it in a full 360 degrees directly into your heart space. And then it breathes out 360 degrees directly from the heart space. But there are other commentaries, very traditional commentaries too, that say actually breathe it in like you're vacuuming it through the nose and it comes in through the nose and down into the heart. <laughs> which is interesting and maybe that maybe that would work for for you or maybe not but i'm offering that there are different ways so you can also be intuitive about it be intuitive mm -hmm. with it trust yourself like okay this isn't quite working maybe i'm guiding it in a way that's slow or not on your breathing rhythm so when you do it at home on your own i mean you're doing it at home right now but when you're doing it on your own in your own rhythm feel the freedom of just taking a little bit less feeling it transform in the heart space and let it ride that kind of hypnotic in and out breath so that there's that feeling of the rhythm there. I love teaching with you, Chandra. It's so wonderful to, um, yeah, to listen and to, and to learn and to jam. I have another uh, offering, Suzanne, if it's helpful, um, which is to, to simplify a bit. And um, maybe you can kind of work up to, to the visual and instead really just have this, um, you know, sense or feeling, right? So we know that there's some sense or feeling of inviting in what's hard. And then some sense or feeling of extending out this joy or care. And so maybe releasing a bit the kind of conceptual piece, which, which maybe is getting a bit tripped up. And so in place of that concept, like highly conceptual visual part, you know, you can just imagine this sense of caring and the sense of caring. It could just be so simple. Caring and a willingness to include, caring and a willingness to share. So please let us know how it goes. We are eager to hear. No, thank you. That's really helpful. I think it's just gotten, it's very cluttered in there with all these things that I'm trying to sort. And I think working with maybe the, a little more somatically the way you're describing that and working up and maybe those sips like Chandra was mentioning. Thank you. I'll, I'll try that and I will let you know how it goes. Wonderful. A thank you. somatic sip. <laughs> yes, a little somatic sip. Um, yay, I'm happy we have more questions here. Ramit, please. Hey. Um, yeah, I feel like um, I just wanted to add, I mean, I feel like with us, with everyone spending so much time at home and with family, this practice is kind of perfect um, <laughs> in terms of uh, people you love, but at the same time, you're like, oh, I'm kind of sick of you now. So <laughs> um, that, and then also, um, I mean, this is a side note, but I love the reference to Hanuman because actually I was, uh, I was born on Hanuman Jayanti and uh, yeah, and my family is uh, Hindu. So, Jay so my nickname is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so my nickname is Hanu. And um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. I appreciated the, the, <laughs> the reference. Oh, Hanuman's so great. I've never it's, thought of that before. It just came, maybe because Hanu is here. It just yeah. came. It just and yeah, yeah. And with, with, with Hanuman, you know, I I love the. If anybody else knows more, Hanuman has this uh, um, the story of him carrying a mountain in his hand, um, where he didn't know which medicine to offer. Hmm. And so instead of picking the right herb, he chooses to pick up the entire mountain. <laughs> and carries that to to Ram. Mm. And I feel like um, mm. 
you know, so many just Prashna Paramita qualities and just, mm. oh, it's just so juicy. Mm. <laughs> oh, yes. Bringing in the great mother, too. Mm. But in a way, the Tonglen is like that. It's like the panacea, right? The, mm. All the medicine could be in one breath. Mm. Thank you. Hanu. Yeah. And, and you can definitely do this practice of um, loved one, unfamiliar one, challenging one with one person. Absolutely welcome. <laughs> I see Leanne and then Paul. Hi, Leanne. Hi. Well, first, I just wanted to say that I so love when you both teach together. It's such, <laughs> a, it's such an amazing um, example of, of female leadership, I have to say, not to gender you too much, but uh, it's, I just, I note it every time when I'm otherwise in a lot of male dominated Zoom rooms and uh, how you pass the tour, it's just so inclusive. I'm like, this is the model. So <laughs> I think that every time. So I just wanted to say that it's like really beautiful. Um, and then I know that there's no one way to do the practice, but um, where if, if while we're on the, the technicalities of it, um, I'm wondering how you think about it. Is it that with your in-breath, you're taking all of the dark cloud or, and, then, and then it comes back on the next breath? Or do you go kind of you know, a gradual throughout the course of the meditation, a little less, a little less? I know there's not a right way, but I, I find myself every time being like, wait, which, wait a minute, getting caught up on that logistic. It's, I mean, you're right, there's no right way and you can be intuitive about it, but most of the ways I've learned it, all of the ways I've learned it actually have been the latter. So it's, you know, breath by breath, really how, however much you can take in with one breath. And then breathe out the cool. So that over the course of 10, 20, 30, 40 breaths, they get lighter and lighter, more and more ease. Great question. Chandra, I'm going to just intervene real quick. Your sound is pretty low. I don't know if other people are having a hard time hearing you, but I just oh. wanted to let you know just in case for the recording and also just, yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Next time, please tell me sooner. <laughs> Paul. Paul. Thank you so much. Um, uh, new student. And uh, as I'm trying to learn about um, compassion, and uh, particularly compassion and emptiness hmm. and compassion hmm. um, and this practice, you know, I, I, I find it, it, it's sort of like this newly terrifying, very intimidating um, kind of prospect when it comes to um, you know, kind of advancing, which is to take on the goal of reducing suffering for all sentient beings. I mean, it's, it seems like it's sort of like the ultimate rolling a rock up a hill eternally. Um, and it's sort of like taking on the suffering. It's like, I just, I always think of like a bathtub, just like filling up with more and more mercury kind of endlessly until it just drops into the void, like um, sort of terrifying. But one thing that, that you were saying that was extremely helpful was to think of the, um, the suffering as a, 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 like a, a smoky, a smoky color um, mm. or a smoke and um, that can be easily transformed um, by metta. Uh, and uh, it makes sense that there needs to be like some kind of alchemy to undertake work like that, um, to, to tweak it so that uh, you're not taking on the suffering of the individual or all things um, as suffering that you suffer but as some other kind of energy that you redirect. Um, but I was curious if, if, there, if, if there are others who feel, or if it's common to feel 
a kind of a dread around this core, this core principle. And if that is one of the ways that people contend with that, are there other strategies that would help make it less truly terrifying? <laughs> Okay, I'll start an easy okay, <laughs> okay, so now I hear it okay, going. I'm wondering, Paul, could you mute yourself and let's see if, that... let's see if that... Okay, yeah, I think that's good. Okay, how's the sound? Is it okay now? Okay, so great question and especially completely um, understandable for some for coming. I'm assuming in, you're not just new to this class, but maybe you're new to Tonglen. Is that true? Just just so I know, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's true that this is uh, not for the faint of heart, right? It's definitely takes some foundation in understanding uh, bodhicitta or compassion and emptiness and how uh, we're not just our bodies, we're not just our suffering, but there's a deeper truth there in terms of the uh, nature of our own consciousness that's beyond destruction, beyond creation. And that's why the the, tong, the Lojong slogans start with absolute bodhicitta for the first six lines. The first six slogans are all about big view. So understanding emptiness, understanding the nature of your mind. And then it goes into the compassion practice. Then it goes into Tonglen. And so I think that you really touched on something very important. So that's that. So it's very important to study and take the time to really think about that and grow more comfortable with it so this practice isn't so frightening or terrifying. But then also, it's true that we have to pay attention to language because what the teachings say is, imagine that you're breathing in the suffering in the form of a dark smoke. So it's true that we're not like literally, so this practice should not be taken literally in, in, in many senses of the word. That you're imagining that you're taking in suffering in the form of a dark smoky vapor is a kind of alchemy. You're not literally taking on their cancer. You know, you're taking on their illness in the form of a smoky vapor that then you imagine that you transform in this Rigpa, this is really your pristine awareness, your primordial wisdom that's in the innermost, you know, is that at the center of the chakra of the heart. And that is an indestructible, nothing can harm that. So what it is, is it's like smog touching the rays of the sun. And the sun is so much more powerful than the smog. And it can evaporate. It's like dew being evaporated with the sunlight. And then that creates that feeling of clarity, of cool relief that we send out with the out-breath. So like you've said earlier to, to um, I believe it was Suzanne, it's good not to be too literal with this, but really drop into the somatic feeling of well, what is it to breathe in, to be willing to breathe in the suffering and be willing to give away that which I normally keep to myself, which is freedom of suffering or love and then i want to end with one thing and then hand it over to eve which is something that a dear friend of mine a colleague elizabeth elizabeth mattis namgyal said and i never forgot it she actually said it when she came to guest teach with me at against the stream when before it became san francisco dharma collective and she had just written a book on emptiness and so she was like you know the expert on how to describe emptiness. She had all these different tools and techniques. She'd bring a stick in and talk about long versus short and relativity and all of that. But I'll never forget what she said about this type of compassion practice because even at the beginning and at the end of our meditations, we make prayers. May I be, you know, may I help all beings be free from suffering. It's like, how, <laughs> how, how do I do that? And she said that something that really touched me, which is as long as we're 
identifying with a small sense of self, of who we are. That's impossible. There's no way we can help all beings be free of suffering. So in that, from that vantage point, from the small self, it's an aspiration. And it's a good aspiration. It's an aspiration that helps us grow into something new. So it's okay to make it from that small, smaller vantage point or, or kind of more con- condensed or solidified vantage point. But she said that when your heart, when you open to the interconnected shunyata, the emptiness of all phenomena, reality, perception, that small solidified sense of self dissolves. It's like the drop of water dissolving into the vast ocean of consciousness. And from that unlimited space of ultimate bodhicitta, of shunyata, emptiness, anything's possible. Anything's possible. And it's within that absolute fabric of space-time dimension collapsing all of that. Then that prayer becomes possible. But it's not something that the smaller mind the limited mind can fathom. But so we make the prayer anyway, even when we're feeling very constricted. We make it anyway, because there's this little hint of the absolute understanding, even if it's just an inkling, a whisper in you, that that is possible. But don't take it literally. It's not like, yeah, I'm going to clean everything up and everybody's someday going to be perfect and in perfect health and we're all going to be perfect together. Mm. (laughs) It's, it's this feeling of eventually everyone will come home to their true nature in their own time, maybe after millions of reincarnations or re- millions of reincarnations within the moment mm-hmm. or it, within this very life. It's more of a coming home than a going somewhere. And there's only one journey, as Jung says. It's the inner journey. <laughs> Very beautiful. Um, I almost don't want to say anything else, but I, um, I'm tempted to to give a more. Um, I don't know what the word is. Um, I I I honor your existential terror, Paul. It's right on, and it's not as though um, folks who've been practicing a long time just get over that. I think in some ways we actually get a bit anesthetized to what we are committing to. And when you're facing it as you are so freshly, you're like, wait, 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 I'm signing up to take everybody's suffering? That sounds hard, unpleasant, and, and, and impossible. So what is this? What is this kind of figurative um, aspiration? And, and I'll just offer two um, ideas to kind of reflect and see how they feel. One is we are already suffering amid the suffering of all beings around us. We, none of us can protect ourselves, especially now more than ever from the suffering of the world. So what are we doing right now about that? For most of us, it's maybe we try to stay informed or maybe we try to avoid. And both of those experiences, avoiding the suffering or kind of keeping up to date, but without being able to do anything, that's an enormous amount of pain. So just, I invite you, I invite, you know, maybe all of us to just kind of recall, like, how much harder is it to not have this aspiration of bodhicitta? How much harder is it to just kind of witness the suffering and feel there's nothing I can do? Actually, maybe I won't even pay attention. A dulling of the heart, a kind of feeling that there's um, no possibility. And the other I'll say is that even this aspiration to help others, which is, you know, in its essence, and we want to understand it from a, a psychological point of view, is an aspiration of altruism. And from a very um, enlightened self-interest approach, it is very beneficial of us to consider helping others. That feels good for us and our own psychological well-being. Altruism is a very uh, beneficial state. So again, I think we aspire to exactly what Chandra is painting for us and and the beauty of exactly how we can um, melt those dew drops with the radiance of our heart 
that might require developing some confidence in this radiance. And along the way, like, yeah, just pay attention to what it's like to not inhabit that. And consider even our small drops of daily altruism, how good those feel and build our confidence that way. Again, let us know, Paul, how it goes. Wow, what a beautiful, rich evening with you all, with Sangha. Just so nice to hear from you and connect with you. Yeah, maybe let's take a moment, just our last minute together to dedicate the merit of our, of our time here. Yeah, really feeling if anything has been stirred in you, some sense of reflection, a sense of connection, an inspiration to our own potential. Consider dedicating that generated energy to this outrageous aspiration that all beings could be free. All beings could experience peace and ease. All beings could know the true causes of happiness and know the deepest sense of belonging. May we all be free. Thank you all. Thank you. Chandra, do you have a class coming up? Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, on the 18th of March, we start Feeding Your Demons in Art. So if people want to do that, you can uh, visit my website, uh, which happens to be www.shunyataemptinessyoga.com. I'll put it here. And on there is my page with all my stuff. But that one's connected to what we do in this class. So... And also, we'll do a Feeding Your Demons uh, guided practice on the last Wednesday of this month, Wednesday, March 31st. But if you're into like working with creative blocks, you don't have to be an artist. It's about really working with the five steps of Feeding Your Demons and then, uh, you know, drawing, painting. You could even sculpt the demon and the ally and how they relate to each other. So it's going to be a fun series. It's a Thursday, four Thursdays in a row. Mm. Thanks for bringing that up. And how about you, Eve? Do you have something coming up? <laughs> Not yet. Not publicized yet. What yeah. I will share yeah. soon. All right. So good. I'm glad we could share this together. And um, I saw a chat coming into you, Eve, there. Mm. Um, oh, yes, I am. I do have something. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> great. <laughs> It's there in the chat. It looks like Eve will be joining forces with some other wonderful teachers on emotional balance and meditation. Uh, Facebook Live Tuesday, April 6th. So the link is there if you want it. You could click on it now before we close the meeting. Thank you, Walt. Great to see you here again, everybody. Mm -hmm. we'll see you next week. Thank you. Ciao. You can unmute and say goodbye if you want. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Maha Shivaratri is tomorrow night, and it's my birthday. Oh. Hey, happy birthday. Hey, hey. we got Hanuman and Shiva. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.